Hi, welcome to Think Tech, coming to you from um, Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. Uh, I'm your host, Hong Chiang, and uh, we have uh, a great opportunity to speak with uh, Professor Michael Davis, who is actually Skyping in from Hong Kong with a, a uh, update on Hong Kong's umbrella movement. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of intro of uh, Professor Michael Davis from University of Hong Kong, and uh, he is an expert uh, in constitution law and human rights. He's both a scholar and a public intellectual, uh, having served on, um, as the chair of uh, the Human Rights Research Committee of the International Political Science Association and the Pacific Rim Interest Group of the American Society of uh, International Law and on um, editorial boards of uh, several human rights journals and book series. And uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Hong Kong. It's my pleasure. Um, I think uh, I recall last year, uh, late last year, we actually had an interview with you. That was when the umbrella movement just started to take shape. And uh, of course, right now, um, it's uh, unshaped, I guess, uh, because last December, the uh, uh, Hong Kong government uh, ordered the removal of the protesters uh, from the streets of Hong Kong. And uh, I um, uh, check into one of your articles, and you talk about uh, the experience of uh, the umbrella movement there. It's a, quite a scene. You talk about youthful exuberance, um, flashing cell, uh, cell phone lights, public seminars, yellow umbrellas, street arts, a tent city, community service, shopping stri uh, strips, and, and uh, global media uh, court orders, and 7,000 police clearing the streets. So you also mentioned this will not soon be forgotten. So that's what we are talking about now today to see what has, has happened after the uh, uh, protesters were taken off the street. But maybe if you could give just a, a very brief um, recap of what happened, what led to the umbrella movement, that'd be helpful for our viewers, um, you know, just to have a brush up of uh, the information. Right. And basically, Hong Kong is operating under a basic law. Uh, and this basic law is the product, it's promised uh, in an international treaty between Britain and China uh, called the Sino-British Joint Declaration, which was a treaty signed in 1984 providing for the return of Hong Kong. In the treaty, they provide that uh, Hong Kong will be returned under one country, two systems, and that Hong Kong would maintain all of its liberties, the rule of law, uh, and, and ultimately have a democratic system. Uh, and uh, provided for Hong Kong's handover by Britain to China in 1997, which took place. Uh, and in the years since then, Hong Kong has operated under that basic law. The basic law that more or less give, provides, uh, as was stipulated in the treaty, uh, for all of these guarantees of human rights, uh, and the rule of law, uh, and so on. Uh, but one of the things in particular that it promises and that had not been done uh, during all, all, all these years is, is democratic reform. Uh, China has long drug its feet on that, and the local Hong Kong government has generally been rather subservient to the Chinese government and more or less does, uh, drags its feet as well. And so finally, uh, uh, well, first I should say the basic law actually says the ultimate aim is universal suffrage uh, in choosing the chief executive and also the legislative council. Uh, and for the chief executive, it says universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee. So when Beijing finally announced in 2007 that now in, 2000, in the coming years here, in 2017, there could be full universal suffrage, uh, the question in Hong Kong people's minds was whether this would be really genuine universal suffrage and give them a real choice. And so the answer started coming this uh, past year when Beijing uh, first issued a white paper more or less saying that Hong Kong people had a lopsided view of one country, two systems, and sort of suggesting that Beijing can more or less do what it wants. Uh, Beijing is the boss, if you will. Uh, and at the same time, uh, well, soon thereafter in August, they issued a, a ruling on uh, Hong Kong's uh, universal suffrage in which they essentially said that they, they set up the thing so that the nominating committee would be a sort of pro-Beijing committee that could vet the candidates. So as this uh, approached, as these events unfolded, Hong Kong protesters, uh, uh, in, in particular one group called Occupy Central, had announced that it planned 
uh, an occupation movement in protest if China did not deliver genuine democracy. And of course, when these decisions came down, it was clear that, that Beijing wanted a uh, so-called democracy where it could manipulate the outcome. Uh, and so these protesters took to the streets, really, uh, in September, right after the NPC decision, uh, and uh, they proceeded to occupy. This this was not really done in, a, in an orderly manner as planned, but was done in a more spontaneous way. And so they occupied the area around uh, the government offices in Admiralty and not exactly in Central. Uh, but be that as it may, they took over in, in some uh, confrontations that took place. They wound up taking over one of the main streets, and they built a tent city on that street in protest. And they stayed there for 79 days, demanding that a, a Beijing withdraw its decision in, in a, a for a, so what they called fake democracy and uh, institute uh, fully uh, adhere to its uh, guarantees under the basic law of universal suffrage. The basic law also requires that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights apply to Hong Kong. So the implication is that it should be genuine universal suffrage as required by Article 25 of that treaty. So I've condensed a whole lot of stuff into a very short description, but we can interrogate it further as you, you desire. Um, that's a, a very, it's a very interesting time because the whole world is watching Hong Kong because uh, it's like people have spoken, right? Uh, what's also amazing is that uh, the umbrella movement ended up uh, uh, with uh, uh, the government clearing the, sta the, the streets and uh, the people didn't get what they wanted. And your recent article is, uh, uh, if I read it correctly, you're basically saying the Hong Kong government didn't really speak for the people and protect the people. Uh, is, is that accurate in terms of uh, your interpretation of what happened uh, when the, as, as, as the end of the Umbrella Movement? Right. This is, has been really, I think, the, the, the problem that's been driving public distrust and public protest is a perception that the Hong Kong government and, and actually beyond the Hong Kong government, a circle of pro-Beijing or pro-establishment politicians uh, really always seem to represent Beijing's views to Hong Kong, but <clears throat> do not seem to do what you would expect for an autonomous region, and that is represent the autonomous region's views to Beijing and uh, seek to guard the autonomy of the region. Rather, they seem to be Beijing's instrument in, in uh, you know, exercising control over Hong Kong. And I think this is, is at the heart of what outrages people. Uh, break, broken promises are, are one part of the problem. Distortions, there's a kind of uh, argument being made by the central government through these local officials that no one really believes, that's not really credible. And so it, it engenders a kind of distrust because it's, there's a perception that this government and, it, and the, our officials here in Hong Kong don't really uh, speak honestly to people, but rather uh, convey Beijing's views. Uh, and so they try to, for example, redefine universal suffrage to say that, oh, all that means is one person, one vote. It doesn't matter uh, who gets to run, that, we, that we're vetting the candidates as they do in Iran uh, is okay as long as everybody votes. Of course, that would make mincemeat out of the concept of universal suffrage because every hardline regime on, the world, on earth uh, purports to let everyone vote. Uh, you know, it matters how candidates are chosen and so on. And Hong Kong people uh, fully appreciate this. But I think it's, it's a problem when the government, A, doesn't fulfill its commitments, but B, sort of makes these kinds of representations because it then means that people can't really trust the government because it's saying things that are really counterintuitive and giving meaning to words like universal suffrage that no one would, would accept. Uh, what's interesting here is uh, the, the Hong Kong government is not listening to the people of Hong Kong and they're trying to get away from uh, uh, supporting the central government uh, from mainland China. Uh, but uh, what's, uh, what's also very interesting is that uh, the current uh, Hong Kong government, the Hong Kong chief, was also elected, uh, given my understanding, at the influence of the mainland government. So in other words, the influence from mainland government has not been new. 
Right. In fact, what, what we have now and have had for the first three chief executives is that they are selected by what's called an election committee. Uh, and this committee is just a, a 1,200 now, is currently 12, it was originally uh, in the early days, 400 members, then 800 members, now it's 1,200 members. So there's a, a kind of view that reform just means increasing the number of members, where everyone here knows that real reform would mean changing how you choose the members of this committee. So the committee uh, holds an election within the committee. Uh, the people vote for the committee, but only about 260,000 of Hong Kong's several million voters are eligible to vote for the members of this committee. And so the committee has historically been heavily pro-establishment with only about 15% of its members coming from grassroots or pro-democracy uh, constituents. So, so, the, the, so that means that in the past, there was a nominating process before this committee, and it required a threshold of only uh, about 12% to get nominated uh, or one-eighth of, of the committee. And so a Democrat could actually get nominated and they would do this just to demonstrate, uh, you know, express their views. Uh, but when they got nominated, they would have no ch chance of being elected by the committee because about 80% or more of it is in, in pro-Beijing, pro-establishment because the constituencies that choose those members are business sectors and other sectors that uh, are safe for Beijing. So the result is the committee is very unrepresentative, even though in the basic law it says it's supposed to be broadly representative. Well, this committee is critical because now Beijing, in its new decision, said it's this committee that would be turned into the nominating committee uh, to nominate candidates to present to the voters at large. And if that's done, and, and more or less the same makeup of it, because the, the decision said that, uh, then the result, and then they said that you needed 50% of the members to be nominated. So this is the mechanism by which they're blocking any pan-democratic candidate from running. Now all of this is, seems a bit odd. Why are they so afraid of pan-democratic candidates? Well, obviously they, they think that such candidates will not be uh, submissive to Beijing or maybe confrontational and so on. But in trying to, uh, to avoid this, they're actually causing the whole society to mobilize against them. So I don't think they've made any gain by trying to block candidates. A more gentle approach that simply uh, followed the commitments in the basic law probably would have worked better to their advantage because then the society wouldn't be mobilized against them and some candidate who ran would probably be foolish to spend all this time confronting Beijing uh, because the, such newly elected chief executive obviously has to please the voters and deliver the goods and usually that involves jobs and a good economy and everything so it really uh, i think was a uh, uh, they were afraid of something that really wasn't going to happen and now they've they've incensed the population and, and actually caused a more confrontational environment rather than avoiding it uh, that's an interesting take on it uh, look, look like uh, it, the central government in china it's just not wise uh, because they, they got the control already in their place, and then they'd want to seal that control by putting this new uh, regulation and uh, that mobilized the, the, the people of Hong Kong. Uh, uh, very interesting. So let's take a quick break, because uh, and then we can talk about what happened after people are off the street, and what is the mood, and what's the thinking, what's uh, way ahead. So again, this is Think Tech Asia, and uh, we've been talking with the Professor Michael Davis from Hong Kong, on a update on Hong, on Hong Kong's umbrella movement. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Kili Akina, president of the Grassroots Very Institute good. and so host of Hey Hana this Fako, <laughs> a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Uh, so, Hana Michael, are we Ko okay now? Let's work together. Think of the sad alternative. Let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday. 2 to 3 p.m. on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. 
Okay, we're back. Uh, we're live. This is ThinkTech Asia, and we've been talking with uh, Professor Michael Davis from Hong Kong on an update on Hong Kong's umbrella movement. So we just gave you uh, a very brief kind of recap of what happened uh, with the umbrella movement. So uh, again, uh, Michael, that movement is no longer, I would say, oh, maybe, maybe it's still going on. So what happened after people are off the street? Maybe give uh, gave us uh, one or two of those uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, feel of uh, uh, what's happening on the ground in Hong Kong. On campus, for example, how do feel, uh, students feel about this? Right. Uh, well, it seems uh, after the, the, the movement and uh, the streets were clear, of course, one argument was, well, have they failed? Uh, because they set, occupied the streets for 79 days and the Beijing government has not offered them anything. Uh, it seems totally indifferent to their demands. Uh, and I think that, you know, some Beijing officials would say they failed, but I, I think for the most part, Hong Kong people appreciate that, that they have actually at least raised the profile of the concern over Hong Kong's autonomy. Uh, and, and there's a, a perception, and certainly among those protest leaders and protesters, there's this idea to carry on with their movement, but now not just by occupying the streets, because all you mind the streets actually uh, runs into the problem of protest fatigue. The society gets a bit tired of having its streets occupied and inconveniences caused and controversy. And so the protesters and some, some people felt had lingered on in the street too long, uh, in effect reducing their support. Uh, but I think any reduction in support was mostly reduction in support for the occupation, not for democracy. A Hong Kong's support for democracy has been really strong throughout many years since uh, the sign of British Treaty was signed, you know, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, and there's a, a appreciation in Hong Kong society that democracy is instrumental to maintaining Hong Kong's autonomy. Uh, and this has become more and more evident to the public because they see a government that's not democratically elected being very subservient to the mainland and pretty much doing its bidding and they perceive this as undermining Hong Kong's autonomy. And many people in Hong Kong have especially value the rule of law. And so they fear that if the central government can do whatever it wants uh, with you know, impunity, that this will undermine the rule of law. So they, they see democracy as important to autonomy and autonomy important to the rule of law. So the, the, the public seems to get this connection rather well. And so what's going on is there's some kind of community activism going on uh, that uh, outreach by protesters and for, protest leaders and so on uh, to community groups. Uh, and there have been a number of uh, kinds of things going on on the Beijing side to which uh, the public is responding in various ways. One of the things is that Beijing, uh, their, their supporters have started attacking academic freedom in Hong Kong. Uh, this has been a real problem because well, at one point the chief executive gave a speech and attacked a student magazine uh, for publishing things that, you know, advocating independence or something. Uh, and then there was a campaign on campus in the student union uh, where words like independence were used. In fact, when the students explain what they mean by independence, they mostly mean just genuine autonomy, that Hong Kong's a real autonomy. But these words are almost incendiary in, in the Chinese leadership's mind that Hong Kong students are arguing over autonomy. And, and this debate uh, even resulted in a breakup of the student uh, union. And, and so th this thing has been quite controversial. At the same time, a pro-Beijing newspaper, it's actually owned by the central government. It's called the One Way Bao. There's two of these newspapers that are essentially Communist Party newspapers that are published in Hong Kong. Nobody, general, most people don't buy these papers. They're just circulating for free. So in the housing estate where I live, I can see every morning there's a pile of the newest edition of the Dagong Bao waiting for us. Uh, yeah, I suppose it's the central government's way of propagandizing Hong Kong. Anyhow, one of these papers, the one by Bao, published an attack on the dean of the law school at Hong Kong U, saying that he was uh, neglecting his duties during this all occupied movement, and uh, well, actually not the occupied movement, but in the preceding years, because he actually stepped down before the occupied movement, but that his neglect 
was harming the law faculty and that he was too focused on democratic reform and so on, and that the Hong Kong U law faculty, in which I'm a member, is too much focused on defending uh, uh, Hong Kong's autonomy and democracy and so on, rather than academic things. So we were put under attack, and this was all in the newspapers, and, and uh, they were trying to block this dean because when he stepped down, he, he was uh, slated to take up the position at the top of the university, not the president, but a, a sort of vice president, what we call a pro-vice chancellor. And so he was to be appointed to that, so they pointed out that he's, they accused him of all these sins in a series of articles, even though I worked with him and under his deanship, and he was highly regarded in Hong Kong as the dean, and very hardworking dean, helped to build our new law school building and everything. So he had quite an achievement record, but there was some reduction in the research assessment. So this, uh, and, and this is largely because the law faculty here tends to publish a lot on Hong Kong issues that are not of global uh, import, so, so that has some impact on Hong Kong's research assessment. But anyhow, all of these complicated things are going on and, and an attack on, on the university. At the same time, uh, the Beijing officials decided and, and pro-establishment officials decided that, wait, why are all these young people protesting? We must not be educating them correctly. So now there's a move afoot again, and they tried this a couple years ago and, and were blocked by massive protests. But now the movement afoot again to have patriotic education in Hong Kong, to try to get uh, our young people to be more patriotic and to understand the mainland and so on. Uh, and uh, this is, is certainly going to meet with resistance because Hong Kong people tend to view this as brainwashing. Uh, and so the other day, there was even a, one of these people said even the international schools should have this same requirement of having some national education. Uh, and why are they saying that? Because they know that if Hong Kong people, if this is done in the public schools, that the Hong Kong people will flee into the, in the international schools to avoid it. Uh, and so they're trying to suggest, no, 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 we're going to block you there as well. So these things are all quite controversial here. There's a sense that the education system is, is under pressure. Now, I'd like to say that most academics and, and teachers, even in the secondary schools, resist this. So, so far, this isn't causing us to censor ourselves. In, in many ways, quite the contrary. People are speaking up. Uh, and so uh, it's going to take more than these kind of threats to silence uh, uh, a, a very robust academic community. We have some of the leading universities in the world here. So that, that's going to take more than that. But it, it is threatening, and people worry about these kinds of attacks on our educational system. Uh, and then we also have con confrontations on our border now over what's called parallel trading, because mainland products are often thought to be dangerous, uh, not properly uh, supervised you know, in terms of health and safety. Uh, a lot of mainlanders like to buy products from outside of China, and they come across the border to Hong Kong. They send these uh, just ordinary people across to buy a bunch of these products and bring them back to the mainland to sell them. Uh, and Hong Kong people have been protesting, and there's been some violent confrontations on our border in recent days. Uh, so it's a kind of uh, building up of animosity or resentment towards maybe excessive numbers of mainlanders coming into Hong Kong and then in some cases in the towns near the border area uh, inundating the towns with these traders uh, you know who are trading in goods so uh, these are all these things are going on at once uh, and in in the middle of all this the government completed a second round consultation this consultation was uh, boycotted by the pan democratic camp so there's consultation over democracy democratic reform it was boycotted, so submissions mostly came only from the government, uh, pro-government supporters. Uh, and that ended just a week ago. Uh, and so the government's going to come up with a bill uh, on this so-called electoral reform in, in conformity with the Beijing decision. And the Democrats in the Legislative Council have vowed to veto the bill because it takes to, to pass this kind of bill requires a two-thirds vote and the Democrats uh, occupy over one-third of the seats. So they have the power to veto it, to block it. Uh, let and me they, ask you uh, a clarification yeah. on this last point that you, uh, you, you talk about uh, 
the uh, revision of the electoral re reform that's initiated by the, the a commission in Hong Kong. Uh, just just uh, give us uh, some clarification on that one. Yeah, what it is is that uh, when this process unfolds under the guidelines that Beijing has laid down, the Hong Kong government has to notify Beijing that there's a need to change the re method for electing the chief executive or the legislative council. When that's done, then the government has to, uh, to do that, the government has to engage in a consultation. So last year, they, uh, in the summer, they had the first round, actually in the, in the spring, in the early January to May, the first round consultation, and then the government filed a report with Beijing saying there's a need to change the method, in effect, initiating a process of change. Uh, when the report was filed, it was widely viewed as misrepresenting Hong Kong people's views. So this also stimulated a lot of distrust and protest. Mm. Uh, and so when it was filed, then Beijing responded by giving all these conditions. Yes, we approve uh, having everybody vote for the chief executive, but under these constraints. Uh, and then, of course, the massive Occupy movement. After that approval is given, then the next step is that they have to engage in a second round consultation, which they did early, uh, you know, from January until now. Uh, and the second round is to formulate uh, the electoral model based on on the guide, the approval that Beijing has given for universal suffrage. Uh, and that consultation was boycotted by pan Democrats, and now has just ended. And and so the next step is the government, and it, this is done by a committee of three. Uh, officials, the government will then, under the, the guidance of the chief secretary who leads the committee, she's the second, number two in Hong Kong, she, they will issue a bill. Uh, uh, they will submit a bill to the Legislative Council for approval, uh, and this bill, will, if it's passed, will then be sent to Beijing for its approval, uh, because the, this bill is not ordinary legislation. It, in effect, amends a, a provision in the basic law regarding elections. So that would, that would be the steps. But in fact, if the Democrats veto the bill, then the existing system of choosing the chief executive by this election committee that I mentioned earlier will prevail. And that's, that's, that's very interesting. So look like if there are all these happenings on all different fronts, uh, that there, there's a government response to the Beijing's pressure in terms of electoral reform. Uh, and there are also what's happening, uh, as you described, uh, at the level of uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say grassroots because of these newspapers, the Wenhui Bao, was uh, uh, kind of uh, sponsored by the Chinese government, but then have this uh, attack on academic freedom. So, so there are these uh, intense in in confrontation on different fronts. Uh, that's very, very interesting. And this is also, uh, in terms of the academic freedom uh, uh, restriction, that's also happening in the context of uh, the Chinese government limiting academic freedom inside China. So a well, lot of, uh, you know, w uh, the way we try to understand the relationship uh, between the Chinese government and, and the Hong Kong people in the government need to be set in the context of what's, uh, what is the Ch Chinese government doing uh, to re limit uh, freedom and human rights inside China. So, so it's re really right. interesting. Maybe you can get to that a little bit after the next break. And again, this is a think tank Asia. And we've been speaking with uh, Professor Michael Davis uh, on an update on Hong Kong's umbrella movement. We'll be right back. Very good. <laughs> Aloha. I'm There's, I actually think President Raspi and host on Ehana Kapko, the weekly program on Big Tech Hawaii on Broadcast Network. Ehana Kapko means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Hello, welcome to back to uh, Think Tech Asia. We're back, we're live. Um, we've been talking with uh, Professor Michael Davis on an update on Hong Kong's umbrella movement. 
So Michael, that's uh, fascinating in terms of uh, the continuing, I would use the word battle uh, between the Chinese government and uh, the people of Hong Kong. Um, I wouldn't say the battle between Chinese government and Hong Kong, Hong Kong government because the Hong Kong government, uh, the government itself, uh, the administration is kind of uh, pretty much under the, uh, the tight control of the Chinese government. But just, just in terms of all these outreach launched attacks uh, really get deeper into the society. So I guess the question uh, next to you would be, do people in Hong Kong feel any way kind of uh, threatened? Their way of life, uh, democracy in Hong Kong is being threatened. And how do they feel about it? Yeah, I think this is, you know, Hong Kong was a colony, so it was never a democracy. Hey. But people, I think, in the years uh, up to and after the handover came to understand that democracy was very instrumental to guaranteeing and maintaining their freedoms. Uh, and Hong Kong has always been a very open society with high levels of freedom, uh, usually ranked among the top in the world, actually, on freedom indexes, and sometimes number one. Uh, and it, it's free market as well, and its economy. So, and, and everyone in Hong Kong, all, when you do opinion polls, they understand, uh, they will always show in these polls that Hong Kong's most cherished uh, core value is the rule of law. It always gets the approval rating of around 90%. Uh, and so when people see uh, the mainland system kind of creeping across the border, more interference, top-down control, uh, they do feel very threatened. It, in their freedoms and even in their identity that there's this argument going around well hong kong if this keeps up will just be another chinese city well many people in the mainland may say well too bad that's you know that's life but hong kong people one country two systems they take these promises very seriously and uh, their identity is hong kong they they so their identity itself is under threat and recently, as you mentioned before the break, uh, the, the mainland itself has gotten more, the, the way the mainland is governed has become more hardline as well. Uh, we know Xi Jinping has a campaign against corruption going on, uh, and this is more vigorous than any previous campaigns. So when China, just the other day, uh, uh, Professor Shumbaugh wrote an essay in the Wall Street Journal that's being widely circulated about the coming crack up of China, that uh, China is in, in a kind of risk because of its policies over recent years with environmental crisis. A woman recently made a documentary on the mainland about the environment and, and put it up on, uh, on one of these uh, lists and it's had a hundred million people log on to it. So even now the meetings in Beijing of the central government uh, is being overwhelmed by people's concern about the environment and so on. At the same time, people have felt that the way, I mean, liberals in China feel the way forward is to reform the political system and then you can deal with corruption because you'll have a, a more open society. But the alternative answer which the Communist Party under Xi has come up with is more control or top-down control. So the mainland is, is having more of that. And in a way, these recent uh, policy directors from the mainland are representative of what's going on in the mainland, in a way, that the Chinese government is increasing its control over the mainland and Hong Kong. And, and uh, that's, that's interesting because uh, these, these uh, um, things are connect connected. The more people, the more people want uh, freedom and democracy in mainland China, the more pressure Hong Kong people are going to experience, uh, that, 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 that's a, a kind of a connection. Uh, but there's right. one question and, I want to... And I would add here, I think it's important that when you talk about academic freedom, that sh the government in China now has come out with these attacks under the, by the education minister on even using Western reading materials in mainland universities. Uh, a year or so ago, they issued a so-called document pro prohibiting mainland universities from teaching about constitutionalism, human rights, and so on. But now they're even attacking the use of Western materials and, and complaining that mainland professors are too westernized and they're polluting the minds of the youth. Now, whether all of this becomes operational or it's just a polemic, we don't know at this stage. But I think all of this is a background, and this is the kind of thing that Hong Kong is concerned about. Uh, so, uh, in, in a way that uh, um, you look at the whole situation of uh, what is, um, it, uh, who's, 
who has failed the people of Hong Kong? Um, your, your article is saying that uh, the Hong Kong government is not protecting the rights uh, uh, of uh, the mm -hmm. Hong Kong people. But the, the source of that, all of that, really goes back to the mainland China. And mm -hmm. is that the sense uh, of a people on the street that they, they would point uh, beyond the Hong Kongese government and uh, point to the mainland government? Well, historically, most public protests have focused on the local government because the local government, the mainland in the past, would try to stay out of things and stay back. And, you know, we knew sometimes when the, there were proposals for patriotic education that these proposals were probably initiated on the mainland. Or when they, there was proposals to increase national security laws, that there probably was some mainland fingerprints on it. But the mainland government more or less let the Hong Kong government take the lead. And so protests were directed at the Hong Kong government. What's been increasingly clear this past year is that the central government is taking more and more direct control. I suppose they're reasoning that, well, the Hong Kong government isn't getting done what we want done. We had to withdraw the national security laws under Article 23. They had to withdraw the patriotic education proposal. So under public protest in both cases. So maybe we should step in. So they've been stepping in. And so now they've become more directly in the, in the public's uh, eye as the source of the problem. But I think still that there's a sense that the real, the worst source of the problem are these so-called pro-Beijing or pro-establishment local politicians in Hong Kong who have a track record of really failing to represent Hong Kong's interest. They are appointed by central government as representatives of Hong Kong in the National People's Congress and in other bodies, but they seem only to represent the central government's concerns to Hong Kong and not the other way around. So I think there's a perception uh, that in many ways these people are the ones who have most failed Hong Kong by, uh, I suppose, they get uh, in, in public mind, they get advantages for speaking out for Beijing. You know, they, they're seen to be a strong loyalist. And in mainland Chinese politics, loyalty is a big thing. Uh, but in Hong Kong's eyes, there, there's really a vacuum. There, no one really represents Hong Kong interest except the street. Uh, and so this, I think, is a problem. Uh, it, it, so, so it's interesting. Uh, the pre pro um, Chinese government officials in Hong Kong, because the Chinese government installed the, installed them. So, what do you expect? Uh, they would be doing the bidding of the Chinese central government. That's exactly how politics works uh, in uh, mainland China. Um, so, um, the 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 this is really interesting to look at Hong Kong's politics, and it's really really becoming more of an extension of the mainland Chinese politics. Uh, the, we just have a few minutes left, and I want to ask you about uh, um, uh, uh, two questions. So let me get to the first question. Quick one is, uh, has there been e any efforts uh, um, uh, of, uh, on behalf of the uh, students in Hong Kong to connect with the Chinese government and talk to the Chinese government directly? Yes, they have. Uh, during the Occupy movement, they actually, uh, of course, this was a media uh, exercise. They, they uh, tried to buy tickets and they wanted to go straight to Beijing and talk to central government officials uh, and they were blocked. They, there's Hong Kong people have a pass that allows them to cross the border uh, freely, but the, their passes were canceled, so they, they couldn't leave Hong Kong to do that. Uh, and even recently, uh, the Democratic, pan-democratic politicians have said they're happy to talk to Beijing, uh, but then the Beijing official, uh, Mr. Li Fei, canceled his trip when they said that they're going to veto the bill. So Beijing seems willing to talk only if, if it's simply to submit to <laughs> the official line, but if you're going to confront them. It's interesting. It reminds me of 1989, uh, the, uh, right, right before June 4th massacre, students were demanding to speak to the government. They did, but then didn't really change anything. Um, so my last, qu last question here is uh, on the international front, that how uh, can uh, people of Hong Kong gain more support um, in the international scene? Of course, the Chinese government uh, would meddle all the time. Um, I just read this uh, very recent report, March 11th, uh, uh, just this month, 
in in uh, um, let's see Toronto uh, or, or somewhere in uh, China Canada there was this a uh, very low profile hearing um, of a uh, Hong Kong democracy act uh, movements and uh, from former uh, legis uh, legislator Martin Lee and uh, the Chinese government sent in a very strong line re uh, a letter requesting uh, the um, Can Canadian government to stop this hearing that actually um, uh, led uh, more people to go to want to hear the hearing. But, but the language of the Chinese government is always very condescending to talk about uh, this uh, issue of Hong Kong. It's very sensitive, complicated, and we hope you don't meddle our internal affairs. So um, this put a block on Hong Kong people gaining international support. So is there yeah. a way to go <laughs> beyond that? The thing that they overlook in this not interfering uh, argument is that they're the ones who took the side of the British Treaty to the capitals of the world and have asked all these foreign governments to deal with Hong Kong separately, uh, not to treat Hong Kong as just another part of China. And all these governments, Canada, the United States, Britain, and all of them treat Hong Kong separately for many purposes, including travel, visas, all kinds of things, trade uh, arrangements. Uh, and so uh, it seems a bit rich to say, well, don't pay attention, don't monitor this, even though uh, you're asked to treat Hong Kong as really autonomous. So the U.S. and other governments, Canada, they, they feel they have an obligation and a right to confirm and monitor Hong Kong's autonomy. And if the autonomy fails, uh, then the implication is that they would stop treating Hong Kong distinctly. Uh, and so the mainland government doesn't like this, but, but they're fully within their interest to do so. And I think this is sort of where it's at. The British government has been especially passive over this because China has dangled very lucrative trade deals with Britain. And so even though the white paper and the NPC decision very clearly pose a risk to Hong Kong's autonomy and the Sino-British agreement, uh, the British have just more or less uh, not challenged it at all. Uh, and so, in many ways, the U.S. and Canada are, are being a little more attentive to the issue. But in, for the most part, China always has a lot of leverage on foreign governments that take interest in these kinds of things, in, including, for example, the Dalai Lama, another issue that I work on uh, quite often, uh, and, and that they uh, can threaten trade sanctions or or withdraw, uh, you know, purchases of airplanes or whatever, if governments are too outspoken. Uh, it's, uh, again, it's a, this is such an interesting question. Looking at Hong Kong as this little island and facing the humongous uh, government of China, and the Hong Kong people are speaking up and then continue to exert their own interest, their their own identity, and their interest in democracy and rule of law. And, and thank you so much, Michael, for giving us that update uh, on Hong Kong. And uh, our time is up. So we just basically need to continue to watch what's happening in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, we uh, wish the best uh, for the people of Hong Kong. Again, this is a Think Tank Asia. And I'm your host, Hong Jiang. And I want to thank, um, again, our uh, remote host, uh, Professor Michael Davis, for that great update. Thank you very much. And we'll thank see you next well. time. Yes, thank you. Okay, we're all Okay, bye-bye.